like this case called Share and Tell, negotiating the disarray of, of, of QLR. Um, some of the research I'm going to talk about is the same project as um, Sheena was talking about earlier on, the Inventing Adults project with Janet and um, Shu Henson and Sue Sharp were all involved in. Um, and also the, the archiving project that, that um, uh, came from that, where we, we did a lot of work about thinking about what would, if you were to archive this kind of data, <coughs> both what would ethical archiving look like in terms of consents, and also how much might that cost per case, which was a, you know, an interesting process in, in terms of, of really seriously evaluating the, the cost of ethical research. And then the third um, uh, example, is the Making Modern Motherhoods um, uh, study, which was um, part of both the identities, ESRC Identities Programme and, and Timescapes. And in a sense, I'm going to um, present them all as experiments in qualitative longitudinal research, because I think that's in a sense what we've, we've been involved in research that's temporal in its, in its character for quite a long time, and we have been experimenting. I think we've been exploring different possibilities and so that's something I want to talk that's really what I want to look at um, today and I also want to contextualize it in in um, it relates very much to what Natasha's talking about um, in this kind of shift uh, from oh, I think of as analog ethics which is probably where I, st I started and when I you know joined as a research assistant in a feminist research project um, in the late 80s this was what I was schooled in, this kind of, it wasn't called analog ethics then, I can tell you, but thinking back, I think, you know, if I think about it in a way as analog ethics, feminists, you know, an interest in feminist epistemologies and in power, power within the research encounter, and within the, the notion of epistemologies and where, where the academy sat in relationship to everyday lives, um, and also the role of sort of praxis and activism in, in, in bridging that. And it, what now looks like a relatively simplistic politics about making the, the private public and using research to get the voices of, that were marginalised in society into the mainstream. And that seemed a clear, you know, a clear, a clear project. Um, lots of questions about br what did that mean in terms of relationships with participants. Lots of stuff about power, feeding back transcripts. What did it mean if a, if a participant didn't agree with your interpretation? Um, lots of interest in those kinds of tensions. Um, and the researcher very much as, uh, as kind of the honest broker, but also a privileged broker, a sense that the researcher had, had some power and always had to account for that and think about that. Um, but also there was, you know, anonymity was assumed in lots of ways as the right thing um, and for lots of possibly rather uninspected reasons now. I mean, I think that's a, something that's, that now is getting inspected um, a, a, great, a great deal more. Within a sort of particular version of social sciences which looked at um, people's lives, um, current alive people's lives, and obviously there are different disciplines and different um, threads where anonymity wasn't assumed or, 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 or privileged. So a shift from analog ethics to in a sense of sort of market ethics, which it feels like we're, we're increasingly in, where um, <clears throat> there's still a big interest in power, but it's not so much as, as a deconstructive project. It's more sort of people experiencing power in new ways within research teams, between um, research teams. So as we are increasingly a conscious of, of competition um, between um, each other, relationships of power with funders and within, particularly with institutions kind of waking up to, to uh, as Natasha was saying, what it might mean to be the owners of the data and beginning to get interested in that. Also, I think we're, it's a much more interdisciplinary moment now than it was then. Um, and I think, for example, in this field, the debate that's happened between oral history and sociology about anonymity is a good example of a sorts of conversations that, um, that are very much part of an interdisciplinary moment where there are really different traditions about, um, you know, in terms of, of issues around archiving um, and um, uh, uh, anonymity. Of, uh, awareness of the on ownership of data, but also the value of data, that it might have value that, um, and it might have value into the future that we haven't uh, understood yet. Um, and there may be sort of ways of linking, exploiting value from data. So where consent and copyright being a real focus of, of attention 
and the po a politics of privacy, which in the sense of it is new as the um, as digital technologies expand enormously the reach of the public. So you know, the kind of the personal is political of the 80s really feels anachronistic in relation to the, so the, the current situation. Um, and I think something really important is about the consequentiality of, of actions in a sort of digital um, world, particularly digital and a, a web world, where, as, um, as uh, Rebecca's saying, something you might have thoughtlessly put into a working paper is out there and has consequences, and we lose control in ways that perhaps we didn't um, previously. Participants as, as collaborators, it feels like there's, there's, there's tensions at the moment, a sense of, you know, move towards much more participatory research in the sense that we are collaborating with participants, but also an awareness of participants as a site of value. Um, but also researchers no longer in such a privileged position researchers as, as collaborators and possibly as a source of value. And I think they're about um, uh, uh, Heather's um, uh, presentation earlier on in terms of you know, the researcher subjectivity, something that is a source of value within a project. Um, and increasingly ambiguous place for confidentiality and anonymity. Increasing lack of consensus, I think, about what they mean and whether they're the right thing, whether they can just be assumed. So. Um, in terms of the work that I've been involved in with, with, with others, the, I thought I was going to trace you through some of our thinking, really, um, in terms of um, longitudinal research. And the first kind of thing that happened to us as a team was that we realised um, we get, you get extraordinary pers uh, perspectives from longitudinal research. So the, that, it adds up the, the multiple encounters meaning you can see more than, than, than you might think or that um, perhaps that anyone consented to say. Um, so the whole is more than some of the parts. And this, this issue of do you, can you see what I can see, I think um, Rebecca's saying that when she's, you know, the, the thought of going back to the, to the stakeholders and saying, can, did you know that we can see this and then do you want that to be published? Um, was very much the, our, the, our first encounter with the ethics of qualitative longitudinal research in, in the Inventing Adulthoods project. And the way we engaged with that was very much from our analogue ethics sort of training around informed consent. We kept, we kept on giving young people their tapes to listen to, say, listen to them. You should listen to them, then you can see what we can see. Uh, given transcripts, often young people were just not interested. They also felt that having these lying around might mean parents would find them, and there was no, it wasn't easy. But also, if we finally f uh, managed to persuade them to listen and look, sometimes they didn't like what they could see, and then we would lose them. So these difficulties, really, about that. In terms of what our publishing strategies, we kind of distinguish a bit between the big picture, where we can make the general generalities without drawing too much attention to individuals. Um, and there we felt very positive about giving, giving back accounts to young people who'd invested a lot of time and energy um, with us. So we did things like negotiate with publishers to give us a copy of the book to every young person in the study, things like that. But also that had consequences. Young people um, could be very upset and annoyed uh, with how they've been represented. Uh, but also in the smaller case study work, you know, real issues about privacy, intrusion, the sort of um, our ability to look really closely um, at people's lives in ways that perhaps um, w neither they nor we really understood that we were going to be able to do through um, as we learned about the methodology in the process of doing it. And here's an example, it might be too small for you to, to see, but um, in the, uh, the book that I published, uh, Unfolding um, Lives, which was just based on, f uh, on five young people's lives, this was uh, one of the things that having given a, a chapter to one of the young women to look at, feeling that it couldn't be published without her consent, at least her seeing it. And she says to Sheena, actually, um, I, I think it'd be much easier for me not to, not to have got this. See, so if you're ever going to do this again, don't bother. I don't think anyone needs to. Um, so, you know, she said, uh, I, I might be more wary of talking to you because you never know what you're going to think about me now. And she responds, uh, one thing that she, she thought was, was funny was that um, she said, I was surprised by the whole, uh, you know, that I should try and transgress conventional modes of femininity. I didn't know I did that. 
But then again, when I think about it, I, I did. But I wouldn't have noticed it myself. So, you know, this, they're complicated encounters, these encounters of going back. They're not either right or wrong. They're complicated. And what's one interesting thing about this young woman was that she told us that she used her pseudonym in the research as her waitress name at work. So at some level, she was, you know, we're all, you know, it's a complicated, um, strange process of being fictionalised or um, your identity being mediated by other people. Okay, so having been, I think, characterised as the belt and braces approach to anonymity when we, at the project where we really explored how could you ethically archive um, a longitudinal data set, so where we, we actually did this and made the data set a proportion of it available in what we thought was ethically appropriate way, um, an expensive way. We also then looked at the, the alternative, which was how can you ethically do, um, uh, forego anonymity. And this is a, a project we did with the Open <coughs> University um, where we made a film with um, five of the young people where they, um, who were involved in the study, where they agreed to forego their anonymity. So they did it in their, in their, own, in their own names. And this was a sort of collaboration with, um, with uh, filmmakers called Angel Eye. And it was a really, really interesting experience for us as, as, as sociologists, or not also a multidisciplinary team, but as academics, having to look and question our assumptions are about what's good ethical practice, working with um, people who came from a different field, so who were documentary filmmakers, who, who um, also were, had ethical practice, but it was different th than our own. Um, and you can see here the way it worked. So this, it was a DVD, it's a DVD-ROM. The introduction, that little bit in the middle, is a new film that was um, made by the filmmakers about the young people now. And then on each of the young people is a, something you can click on. And so if you go, we go on to the next one, so Shauna, for example, one of the young women, um, we have the, the bit in the middle is a new bit of film with Shauna now. And then under each of these ages, you click on it, and what you get is Shauna listening to a selection of um, audio extracts from her interviews, for instance, when she was 16. Um, and, uh, and it goes, so we have extracts, so a tiny proportion of the data but um, you know, a bit like the Big Brother best bits for, for your, the different ages. So for example, at 16, first of all you get Shauna, the first part of the film will show you Shauna with an object from when she was 16, so a bit of memorabilia, and this is her, the, the teddy bear that her, her boyfriend had bought her when she was 16, she talks about that. She then puts on the cans and listens to herself with a very different voice, talking at high speed about all sorts of things when she's 16, she's reacting. And it's actually very moving um, material, just watching her face, listening to herself. And then she has to turn to the camera to the, uh, and, and account for herself around it. So it's, it's actually a really interesting form, and it was a way of animating the, the material and actually showing what it was, but also folding it back and giving the young people an opportunity to for it to be their material and to, 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 to get more, uh, to go further, really, with it. And in terms of lessons, or, um, I think what our biggest lesson was that we, as researchers, we have a huge amount to learn from other people about communication, animation of, of our, what we have very rich material, but often it's just, it's not necessarily um, put too much work. Um, it was really interesting for us and very anxiety provoking letting go of responsibility and control. So actually at a certain point the filmmakers no longer wanted us with them. They said they would rather go and do the interviews with the young people without us and it was really very difficult, um, very difficult sort of um, process of, of trust. Um, which was both gen generative and surprising, but also had sometimes it had some not such great effects as well. So I mean, it's not, not a straightforward um, process. Um, and we had to be very trusting. We had to work really closely with, with, with the filmmakers. Because for them, this was working in a completely different sort of way than they normally would do. Including, for example, um, that the, uh, the audience for this was only uh, an educational audience, as opposed to what they would normally do, which would be to ask young people for what they call a blood chit, which is a consent to all uses everywhere in perpetuity, it would be the norm. 
So they did something different because we were, because we were researchers. Um, I wanted to give you an example of another experiment, a more recent experiment we had, we've, we've made around, and um, this has been with the support of um, Timescapes, um, uh, with a, another, another study which is uh, both a longitudinal and an intergenerational study about um, motherhood. And what's interesting maybe about this is it's not based, well, it, 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 the wave that we did this work on uh, drew on ethnographic rather than, rather than interview material. And a key part of it was showing, so in, in representing it and making it public, actually what we did was show the researcher as well as the researched. So the researcher became, became visible. And that's a really interesting experience and again, very uncomfortable. And there were all sorts of processes of sharing the backstage of the research. Um, and perhaps the most, most tricky part of this research, this project, was um, showing our field notes to the participants. So it was, it's one thing showing field notes to audiences, but we actually needed to start by sharing our field notes with the participants um, that we'd done the research with. And this, these were based on a day in a life observations where we went with using a sort of work shadowing model. We spent the day from as early as possible to as late as possible with, um, with the mothers in our, in our project, um, just walking alongside them using photographs and um, we didn't use any recording material apart from, from the camera and we negotiated taking photographs with them. Um, and then we wrote thick descriptions, really sort of detailed, detailed field notes, which were then kind of edited and negotiated with, with the mothers. And this was used, and we worked again a collaboration with a filmmaker to create a, web, a, a multimedia website. So just before I show you a little bit of it, um, again, this is there's lots of this 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 material is neither anonymized nor straightforwardly non non anonymized non anonymized. <laughs> so it's very much in the sort of eliding of, of, of the real. Um, there is some anonymization and there's some, some material that's not anonymized. Um, and we very much uh, saw ourselves as probably stepping outside of the comfort zone of the social science tradition to, to be in some, some more closer to a documentary tradition in doing the, in doing the work. So I'm just going to go from one. And maybe the important thing for you to know is that this website is an open access website. So you, when you go onto the website, you, you come to this page. And if we go into the interactive, this is, we, this is the part of it that's about a day in a life. And we have the, the mother and the child um, for, for our different case studies. Um, I'm only going to have time to show you a little bit of it. Yeah. So this, this is an example um, of, of Kim. Um, who was one of the teenage mothers um, in the in the study? And as you see, as we go along here, we have in, we have a sort of map. We have a, a clock, so it's about the, the course of the day. So we're looking at temporality in a much sort of smaller, fine-grained way. We have a, a sort of uh, a map, and then we, these are, the, are some of a selection of photographs that were taken throughout the day. So we go from this is the morning at the home. Um, but on each of these, um, on each of these uh, photographs, we have, if we go on to it... At the nursery, all the children are playing outside. Ryan sees us straight away and runs up to Kim. Tempest takes a little longer. Kim and the nursery worker exchange a few words about the heat and protecting Tempest's pale skin. The nursery worker refers to Tempest as a handful. OK. So it's basically a kind of animation of the day, the day in the life um, across the course of the, of the course of the, the day. And each one has um, embedded in it um, audio um, and they're highly edited extracts of the, um, of the field notes, and which we were really reliant actually on the filmmaker. She did what she called, um, she carverized it, like, as in Raymond Carver. So she looked at it and she, she tried to find the gems, what she felt were the gems um, from, um, from this. So um, I'll just show you. Kim says, shall we go to the shop on the way home and buy you two a drink? The shop's quite full. The children run up and down along the aisles, taking things off the shelf and then taking the shelves off the bracket. Kim tells Tempest, I'll kick your bum if you don't stop that now. The children choose a drink and we wait in the queue. 
A man comes up to Kim and asks her to get a couple of things for him, passing her the items and the money. She tells me later that he is Darren. She went out with him for a while when Tempest was one. Okay, I, I, won't, I won't really have time to show you more, but you can, it's, you can just go and um, spend some time and hang out with these women across their, across their day. But as you can see, or you probably imagine, this was like a big step for us, both in terms of out of our comfort zone, um, both in terms of negotiating it with the mothers, so requiring us both to show them this is, how we, this is what we see, what do you think? Um, and them having the opportunity to, to talk back to us and to edit it. And they did edit the material. Um, but also to show ourselves as researchers. And that was Mary Jane Kahili, who's one of the co-researchers on the project. And we all, we decided uh, that we would record the field notes in our own voices. So it's the researcher who wrote it who is being recorded to try and um, actually sort of own own our own work and own our own perspectives. So all of this was 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 quite new um, um, experience for us. So I'm just going to summarise now. I mean, I think one of my reflections is I feel less and less certain about any ethical issues as time goes by, but more and more interested in the ethical labour and engage and prepared to engage in it. Um, I think it's very important. The the interdisciplinary conversations are really important, and I've personally learn a huge amount from working with people who have a different tradition um, and also people who aren't academics as well um, with different kinds of tra um, tra uh, practices. Um, we, are, we do not have, uh, we're not the only ones who are interested in ethical practice. Um, but I also think this issue of indexicality is really, really important, both in terms of, you know, the historical context being absolutely vital for what things mean and what um, the consequences are um, in terms of the you know, technological um, issues, the, you know, the, the, the economic crisis, you know, the difference between when the thing, people are thriving and when they're not. All of that is incredibly important. But also the ethics are always situated in, in really, really important ways, including, our own, um, in, including for ourselves, our ethical positions and our ethical traditions don't always equip us to deal with the, with the new ethical issues that are presented, for instance, by new technologies or um, new uh, assumptions and desires on the part of the participants in, in research. So we have to keep doing the work. We can't just assume, a, take up a position. Um, and I suppose it's, yeah, the last thing was just the, um, there's real tension between a desire to experiment or a need, or actually a compulsion, if you want to get funded, to experiment and to be innovative and to be open to the new, but also uh, a, a, an ability and a sense of responsibility about the consequences of your actions. Um, and the, um, the real difficulty that we can't actually know what, a, what the afterlife of a research text you know, that we can't necessarily know what will happen and dealing with that kind of uncertainty.